Hello, bearded bee people. Welcome back to Being KBs. Understanding the inner workings of a beehive and how these bees communicate and accomplish certain tasks is certainly essential when you're trying to be a good beekeeper and get these bees to do the things that you want them to do. Today on this channel, we're going to talk about pheromone communication, the different types of pheromones and how they use them to regulate the inner workings of the hive, and how we as beekeepers can use that understanding to be better beekeepers and make more successful splits. Pheromones are scents that are given off to communicate something or to trigger a biological response in another member of the same species. In terms of honeybees, they have a bunch of different pheromones that they use for a bunch of different tasks. Some of them are communication pheromones like, hey, come over here, there's somebody at the entrance of the hive that we all have to sting and defend against, or the regulation of the workers graduating into different jobs. Understanding a couple of these different pheromones will truly make you a better beekeeper when it comes time for making splits or preventing swarming or just generally keeping a queen right hive. We're going to go through a list of some of the more important pheromones in the honeybee colony to us as beekeepers, and we're going to start with the most important, and that is queen mandibular pheromone. Now, the queen gives off a scent that is a combination of a bunch of different pheromones, and we call that scent the queen substance. The main portion of the queen substance is this queen mandibular pheromone. It'll do a bunch of different things over the course of the queen's life, including attracting drones on her mating flight, to attracting her retinue inside the hive when she's laying eggs, and to instigate worker bees to clean and feed brood. The reduction of this queen mandibular pheromone, whether through an aging queen or a growing hive that has a ton of members that sort of dilutes the scent, or through some type of emergency, some type of chaotic situation that killed the queen. Either way, the reduction in the queen mandibular pheromone will always result in what's called a queen event. And when I say a queen event, I mean the creation of a queen cell for one reason or another. The bee's satisfaction level with their queen is directly tied to the amount of queen mandibular pheromone she gives off. At the beginning of her life, she'll give off quite a lot. She's a young, vibrant queen. And she'll get these bees to do all the things in the hive that they need to do in order to take care of that brood nest. As she ages, that queen mandibular scent is going to go down and down and down steadily over the course of her life. At some point, reaching a threshold of a minimum level of QMP where the bees will start to either supersede or swarm, depending on the size of the colony and the time of year. If you reduce this queen mandibular pheromone in an artificial sense by removing the queen, you're going to see the start of queen cells within the next day or so, as soon as those bees realize that their queen is not there, and they realize that by the reduction of this queen mandibular pheromone. So, obviously, understanding this queen mandibular pheromone and how it works and how it can get diluted as the hive grows and weaken as this queen ages and understanding the fact that when this pheromone gets below that threshold, you are going to have a queen event. Well, that understanding is great because that allows you to make certain that you have a queen right hive or make certain that you have bees that are ready to accept a queen because you understand the fact that if that queen mandibular pheromone is still very highly present in the hive, they're not likely to accept a new queen. So when we're installing a new queen or making splits that we're going to install a new queen into, we've got to give that hive enough time for the queen mandibular pheromone to dissipate, or otherwise those bees are not going to be aware of the fact that they don't have a queen and they're not going to be likely to accept a new one. Another important aspect of the queen mandibular pheromone is the fact that it is one of the major contributors to what keeps the worker bees' ovaries from developing. Now, honeybees are eusocial creatures in the sense that they all work to aid in the queen's creation of brood. In normal times, the workers don't try to have offspring of their own at all. But in times of emergency or in dire times, when there's not a laying queen inside the hive, the workers will start to lay eggs. They've never gotten mated, so those eggs are going to be drones, but this is sort of a last-ditch evolutionary effort to spread their genetics out before they die. Now, this is obviously something that we want to avoid as beekeepers. We call this laying workers, and it's a bad problem. It's a, it's a tough problem to rectify once it's started. So 
keeping a good queen inside your hive and making sure that you keep these worker bees ovaries from developing in times of queenlessness is essential if you want to continue to have that hive be productive. So understanding that this queen mandibular pheromone is one of the main things that inhibits the development of these ovaries of the worker bees is a good tool as a beekeeper. Another pheromone that is essential to understand as a beekeeper is the brood pheromone. Brood pheromone is given off by open and closed brood and it triggers responses by the nurse bees to get fed and taken care of, but it also is one of the major contributors to inhibiting the worker bees ovaries from developing. So whenever somebody tells me that they think that they have a queenless hive or that their hive has been queenless for some period of time, my immediate response is always give them some milk brood. And by milk brood, I mean open brood that's swimming in royal jelly because of this brood pheromone. Now, not only because of the brood pheromone, but also to supplement the population, but mostly because of this brood pheromone, which is going to inhibit those worker bees uh, from having their ovaries develop and inhibit that colony from developing into a laying worker colony, which once again is a pretty big problem. It's pretty tough to rectify once it's started. So understanding that this brood pheromone, as a queen dies and stops creating brood and her queen mandibular pheromone dissipates, that brood is the only thing that's left that's keeping those worker bees ovaries from developing. So you as a beekeeper, when you come into your hive and realize that there's no new brood that's being created, that's one of the first things you should think of. Go grab some brood from another hive, give it to them to buy yourself some time before you just have to shake all your bees out and cut your losses. Another pretty essential pheromone to understand is the alarm pheromone. Now, the alarm pheromone is one that we are probably all pretty familiar with. Um, if you've ever been stung on the face or just for whatever reason uh, smelled the sight of a sting, you may have noticed that it smelled a lot like banana Laffy Taffy. I think it's banana oil, but the thing that it reminds me of immediately is banana Laffy Taffy. And that is one of the kinds of alarm pheromone that exists in a honeybee hive. And the response that that triggers is for more bees to come and sting the intruder. So this is something that's obviously pretty essential to understanding as a beekeeper, whether it's in terms of smoking your colony before you really truly get in to sort of mask that alarm pheromone, or quickly getting a stinger out of your arm and putting some smoke over that to prevent these bees from smelling that alarm pheromone and continuing to attack your sting site. The forager pheromone is a regulatory pheromone, and that is given off by every single forager bee inside the hive. The higher the amount of forager pheromone, the longer the nurse bees will stay in nurse bee duty. The smaller the amount of forager pheromone, the quicker they will graduate to becoming foragers. And you can pretty quickly see how this will easily regulate the amount of forager to nurse bee workload and also give a colony an ability to work even in times of chaos, like just after splitting where there might not be a whole lot of foragers inside the hive, some of those nurse bees will quickly graduate to forager duty and get out and start bringing back the groceries. Another interesting pheromone, and the last one I'm gonna mention here, it comes from the nasonoff gland of the honeybee. I'm not 100% certain what the pheromone is called. It might be called the nasonoff pheromone, a lot of people refer to it sort of jokingly as the come hither pheromone, and that is because its use is to attract workers to each other in times of chaos. Sometimes that means swarming, but in most cases it's like when a hive gets blown over or knocked over by a bear and all the bees get separated from each other, they can find each other and get back into one location. This pheromone smells like lemongrass oil, and that is the reason that often if you read about a swarm trap or creating a swarm trap, It'll often say to put a little bit of lemongrass on a cotton ball and put that inside your swarm trap because that's likely to attract scout bees because they are attracted to that nasonoff pheromone. So mentioning these pheromones and how the bees use them to do various things doesn't necessarily make us a better beekeeper. Although I did mention a few different things that we use these pheromones for as beekeepers. Now I'm going to get specifically into how to become a better beekeeper because you understand pheromone communication. Preventing swarms is a struggle that we all face. I mean, as soon as these bees get out of the winters, their number one goal is to build up quickly so that they can swarm and still have enough time in the year to build up enough resources to go through the winter successfully. 
So as beekeepers, we're trying to prevent this swarming all the time and trying to do it to our favor in terms of pulling splits. But understanding the queen mandibular pheromone and its role in swarming can really truly keep your bees from the trees really effectively. As I said, the queen mandibular pheromone dissipates or weakens over time as a queen ages. So for this reason, first year queens are really unlikely to swarm. So if you've got a package and you're just adding boxes to your package all year, you can successfully go through that year without pulling a split and without having your bees swarm just because of the fact that that's a very young queen and she's giving off a lot of QMP. Now, in terms of an overwintered hive, a hive that has a queen that's already gone through a buildup portion of the year, that hive is much, much more likely to swarm, largely because of the fact that that queen is giving off a weaker queen mandibular pheromone. So we understand now that these older queens are more likely to swarm, and then we also have talked about the dilution of this QMP as the, as the colony grows. So if we're talking about our overwintered colonies and we're adding boxes to them in the spring, it's a ticking time bomb before another box is added and that dilutes the QMP just enough and then you're going to start seeing swarm cells all over the place. So as I said, in terms of like a package or a nuke that you set out that you gave a queen cell to, you can successfully get those bees through the entire year without having them swarm or attempt to swarm at all just because of the fact that she's given off a lot of high quality QMP, as opposed to those overwintered colonies that you really do have to split at some point, at some point during the buildup portion of the year. And you've got bees that won't stop creating queen cells. In a lot of cases, it can be just the fact that these bees don't accept their new queen, which might have had something to do with pheromones and how you install that queen in the first place. But when you're trying to get a colony to continue to live with their queen and trying to not have to have your queen be superseded, you really do have to understand that those bees are responding to the queen mandibular pheromone levels and convincing them to live in a lower QMP situation is not good for them or you as a beekeeper. This evolutionary tactic is meant to always keep a young, vibrant queen in the colony so that they can always be producing brood at the highest, most effective rate possible. So trying always to pull these queen cells out of these colonies when your bees are trying to supersede your queen is going against what they're naturally doing in response to that queen mandibular pheromone. Preventing laying workers is one of the main reasons I'm making this video. Because of the fact that it's inevitable, once a colony goes queenless, that at some point they're going to start having these worker bees lay eggs. And there's a lot of misconceptions as to how to fix a laying worker colony. I'm not going to get into that right now, except for to say I don't try to fix them at all. It's very difficult. There's a lot of myth in regard to how to fix them. So I always advise prevent it. Don't, don't let it happen in the first place. And so obviously, number one, that means you've got to be getting into your colony, always checking to see that they actually have a queen, that they're creating brood actively. And as soon as you see that they don't have a queen, you have to, number one, get on getting them a queen or a queen cell, and number two, give them some open milk brood. Now, obviously, they're going to start creating queen cells with that brood, which may or may not be what you want. But either way, that brood pheromone is going to work to your favor, inhibiting those laying workers from starting to destroy your colony. So once again, always stay on top of your colonies. And at the very instant you think that they are queenless, give them a frame of open brood. Now, you can use that to see if they're queenless by coming back in a couple days to see if they've started cells. If they have, then yeah, you were right. They don't have a queen and they're trying to rectify that. You can let them do it or not. Usually it's a low population situation and I don't really advise letting those kinds of situations create queens. But either way, that pheromone, once again, will inhibit that laying worker instinct and give you some time to purchase a queen or to develop a proper queen cell. Getting bees to accept a queen can be difficult at some times. I mean, some bees are just less likely to accept. They're more aggressive against intruders. And that can be a difficult situation in and of itself. But if you're trying to give a queen to a colony that you just pulled a queen from, you're always going to have problems because of this queen mandibular pheromone still being so highly present in that colony. 
So truly understanding that we have to let this dissipate in order for these bees to be willing at all to accept a queen or queen cell is essential, lest you continue purchasing queens, installing them, and coming back to find them dead. I pretty much mentioned the catching swarms aspect of pheromones inside a honeybee colony, but I'll mention it again. Uh, the Nasanoff gland smells quite a lot like lemongrass oil. If you've ever delivered packages or had a package of bees inside your car, you've probably noticed it, or maybe you've stood next to a swarm. You can just smell that lemongrass oil coming right off of them. So for this reason, uh, most of the DIY swarm lures that you'll find on the internet have something to do with lemongrass oil that you can just purchase at a health food store or online or whatever. My recommendation in terms of swarm lures is old comb, old brittle comb, but a lot of people don't have that. And another completely viable option is lemongrass oil on a cotton ball to mimic that Nasanoff pheromone. And lastly, Preventing stings. Uh, once again, there are a couple of different alarm pheromones inside a honeybee colony, but understanding the fact that when you crack the lid or you walk in front of that colony or mess in any way with that colony, those first bees to the guard duty area are going to start giving off some of that alarm pheromone that is going to recruit more bees to being guards which is likely to give you an issue as a beekeeper, especially if these are generally angry bees. So in this case, we use smoke and we give them time and we move slowly and all that kind of stuff. But understanding the propagation of this alarm pheromone when you're getting into the colony and when you're doing your various management techniques is a good thing to be able to prevent a colony from really truly just growing more and more angry as you're going through the frames. Pheromone communication is interesting. I hope you agree with that. And then the tools that we based off of this pheromone communication I think are useful and I hope that you find them useful and that you found this video useful. Either way, thank you very much for watching. I appreciate the heck out of you being here. We have a Patreon if you're super inclined to help financially. It's patreon.com slash bkbs. But either way, once again, I'm very happy that you guys joined me here today. If you want to see other videos as they come out in the future and we'll have more in just a couple days, click subscribe. I'd appreciate the heck out of that too. But otherwise, get out there and have some fun with your bees. See ya.